Hello everyone, this is Alison Gross and welcome back to TMI Corner. I haven't done one of these in a long time. This one is a biggie. I am going to be talking about taking care of yourself at home while depressed. Um, if you saw my update last year, you know that I have depression. I've mentioned it in previous videos, like both like personal videos and um, just a second, let me pause this. Both my personal videos and I have, you know, offhandedly referenced it in a lot of my Let's Play videos because it's a massive part of my life. Um, and one of the things that frustrates me is that so much of the focus with depression is on treating depression, curing depression, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, everybody will say therapy and medication, therapy and medication, therapy and medication. Um, and those do not work for everybody. Um, in general, our society is so focused on SSRI medication and cognitive and dialectical, be dialectical behavioral therapy to treat depression that I feel that there is a lack of exploration of other outcomes. Um, I personally am, I want to say opposed to those solutions, but they don't work for me. Um, I am not interested in having my head messed with and my, you know, values or beliefs being reprogrammed, even if it would make me happier. Um, and I have been on SSRIs uh, several times in my life. They do help. They do make it so I'm not actively depressed in the same way, but they have a lot of extremely unpleasant side effects for me. And this doesn't mean that everybody will have that reaction. I've heard that, you know, reactions to medications vary drastically. It's just very frustrating to me because these are the, the frontline, overwhelming go-to things and it's very hard to get medical practitioners to explore any kind of other options. Now this doesn't mean even that on a broader sense I am opposed to therapy and medicine. I do see a therapist um, but she's very like this is the first therapist that I've been able to um, actually work with and trust and be okay with. Uh, and that's because, you know, her approach, at least the approach she uses with me is very different than most therapists. Um, she doesn't challenge my thoughts or my emotions. Um, she's much more in some ways kind of like a life coach for me in that it's like she helps me navigate situations. Like when I say like, I'm having, you know, this problem and I'm having, you know, my anxiety and my depression are making it even harder to approach this problem. It isn't like what you're feeling about the problem is wrong. Let's fix your emotions. It's okay. Let's explore alternative actions you could take with regards to this problem, um, you know, and figure out what kind of a solution you could take that would work for you. Like how can you approach this problem in a way that's effective but doesn't um, compromise you ethically? Um, and she helps me sort through those options. She also, you know, does research for me, like, you know, how can I get accommodations for, uh, for things? What is a new, like, if there's new treatments on the market that I'm you know, interested in. She helps me be informed about those. Um, so she's very much of a, you know, support person and a, again, you know, my approach isn't to cure my depression because I don't think it's curable for me personally, unless I 
sort of eliminate myself. Like, unless I change myself to the point that I'm no longer me, which I would don't want to do. Um, but she helps me cope with it. She helps me learn how to function with like how to live with my depression and how to make it so that it impacts me as little as possible. And likewise, I'm not opposed to taking things for it. Um, I was going to bring over a bunch of stuff to show you guys. Uh, one of the things I do is I take uh, CBD oil, which, you know, to help me like it helps bring your emotions down and stuff. Um, I've tried various herbal things over the years. Most of them are not super effective. Um, and also I'm very interested in like non-medication based treatments. Like I really want to try TMS. Um, and that's one of the things, you know, she's, she helps me like be informed about it and has said that if I decide to go for it, cause there is a place that does it like right by where I live. She'll help me fight to get the insurance coverage for it. She'll help me, like, you know, interface with the people there and make sure that, like, I have a safe and informed experience and stuff. Um, and that's something I'm really seriously considering. I, you know, I'm not, like, anti-therapy and medication at all. I am just anti the fact that our society has a very specific sort of box that it tries to cram you in with regards to that. At least that's been my experience dealing with therapists and psychologists in the past. Um, and so what I want to talk about, um, you know, and even if you do like opt to go for therapy and or medication, you, um, first of all, there's a chance it won't work. Um, some people it just doesn't work on other people the you know very the type of therapy or medication or the dosage of it or something is very specific to find the right thing that works and so some people i've heard you know are depressed and it takes years for them to find the right combination that works or even if you do find the right combination these things take time they have you know several months of onset time um, the unfortunate thing is they also have several months of on offset time <laughs> if you decide to stop taking your medication um, because it's having bad side effects, you know. But the point is that, you know, several levels of that, you know, so even if you are pursuing therapy and medication, even if you find the right combination for you, there's still probably going to be a period where you need ways to manage your depression yourself while you wait for things to kick in. And so whether it's a few months while that happens, a long time while you find the right thing, or in my case, probably a lifetime of this is just your lifestyle and this is how you live. I wanted to talk about things that, you know, you can just do in your personal life to kind of grease the wheels a little bit um, and talk about what I do to make my life with depression more bearable and manageable. And these are not like, this is not things that are going to work for everybody all of the time because depression is incredibly personal and the type and severity of depression you have is going to affect things a lot. And it's that also isn't going to be the same. That can change over time. Um, so that's the first thing I'm going to say. The very first thing that you want to do is always be informed. Um, I talked before, you know, being informed about treatment, like what are my options? What, what can I do? But even before that, you need to be informed about what you have, like what, what is the condition that you have? Um, because there are several different kinds of depression. There are several different, like symptoms or sub conditions that can manifest as part of depression. There are a lot of conditions that are very similar to depression. There are a lot of conditions that sort of can coexist and interplay with depression. Um, and knowing the specific cocktail that you're dealing with will, you know, be very important 
to um, figuring out what steps you should be taking because it will vary. Um, so in my case, I have, um, I've heard it called several different things. Uh, it's called dysthymia, it's called minor depression, it's called high functioning depression, where it's not so bad that you can't, you know, get out of bed or you're suicidal or something all the time. Um, you just, you feel low, things are hard, you, you know, have self-esteem issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there's lots of great resources that talk about this. Um, it's, you know, we have these stereotypes about depression, which are more like major depression where you can, you know, you, you can have really extreme emotions. You can not be able to get off, off the floor. Um, and I have major depressive episodes sometimes where I am just, I fall apart and I can't do anything. Uh, but the majority of the time I am able to function and I'm able to look to somebody outside like I'm a semi-normal person, like a very sad normal person, but still a functioning normal person. Um, now, to be fair, I minimize contact with the outside world so that I have to fake it as little as possible. But the thing is, so I, you know, and I've known that I've described myself as having depression pretty much my whole life, but I didn't know for a long time there were these different kinds of depression or, you know, the different ways that it can manifest and stuff. And one of the things that this therapist I work with now, she is the first person in my life. And like, I'm 40 now. I mean, admittedly, it was a couple of years ago that I started seeing her and she, she did this, but this is the first time I've been formally diagnosed in my life. Um, which, you know, I mean, diagnoses are sort of arbitrary, but in some ways, knowing that is a comfort to me and I can look up what are the typical symptoms of these conditions? How do they affect you? So I can be more informed. So that's a very helpful thing she's done with me, but I would describe myself as having like dysthymia or minor depression or something basically all the time. And then with major depressive episodes, um, which are usually related to one of two things. One, something bad happens in my life, like something that makes me sad or puts strain on me, which, you know, what having dysthymia all the time means is that I don't have the kind of emotional reserves that a normal person has. I'm kind of emotionally running on fumes all the time. Um, and so if somebody has like a major frustration or upset or grief in their life, you know, a normal person can deal with it and pro process it and, you know, not fall apart from it. And I can't because having the dysthymia all of the time means I don't have an emotional reserve to draw on when that happens, I just collapse. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing that will cause me to have major de depressive episodes is menstrual cycle. Um, and I've talked about this before. I have dysmenorrhea. I have my menstrual cycle causes me both extreme physical pain and extreme emotional pain. Um, I, even at times when I'm fine the rest of the time, I will frequently like have a major depressive episode where I just lie on the floor and cry for a day or two right before my period starts. Um, and this is a thing, this is a, you know, conditions that can interpenetrate that you can have dysmeria and suffer depressive episodes when you have that and be fine all of the time. Or you can have, you know, dysthymia and not, not have a, you know, emotional reaction to menstruation or something. Or like me, you can have a thing where you have dysthymia most of the time, but because of the added pressure that's put on you by the dysmenorrhea, it causes you to, you know, have these major depressive episodes based on your menstrual cycle. And that's another example of 
you know, where I do take medication, I use, like, I take uh, female hormones, I take birth control that is designed to uh, m make you, like, go off your period or, like, severely mute your period so that it, it um, doesn't happen as much. And I do this both to try to um, mitigate or eliminate the physical pain that puts additional strain on my body and to make it so that my, my hormones don't fluctuate because <laughs> your period is caused by your hormones fluctuating, but when your hormones fluctuate, it also causes mood changes. And so it's, and it's really hard for me to cope with the mood changes. So I, I don't take like the estrogen pills that you go on and off of and stuff. I take, you know, progesterone pills that you take all the time to try to because one of the things that I found is the drop in progesterone level that happens right before you menstruate makes my depression worse. So I take progesterone to try to semi counteract that to have a more even floor as it were. And that's because I understand how menstrual hormones work and how dysmenorrhea works. But you know, it's taken me a long time to figure that out which is one of the reasons you should be, you know, informed about your individual condition. The other two things that I deal with that I would say are the worst things about depression. I do have feelings of hopelessness. I do have a ton of self-hatred. Um, I wish the feelings of hopelessness would go away. The self-hatred I'm totally fine with and I'm not interested in doing anything about that. Um, the two things about depression that I hate the most that I desperately, desperately want to get rid of which are closely intertwined and these are common symptoms of depression or co-conditions with depression are anhedonia and disassociation um, anhedonia just means you can't enjoy things like you sensations are sort of blunted or sensations do not produce joy um, anhedonia <laughs> basically you know means that you don't have a sex drive anymore um food can be can seem bland to you uh things like i don't know like playing sports or going outside or you know things that are like normally exciting you don't you don't get that you know emotional kickback from them uh, things, it, it just doesn't feel appealing to do things you don't get, you don't experience pleasure basically. And so you don't have an internal reward center and so you're not motivated to do anything basically. Uh, so yeah, anhedonia is, is just basically kind of not, ex either just not experiencing sensations or not having an emotional response to those sensations basically and then disassociation is feeling sort of out of body it, it feels like you are watching your life in a movie or you are viewing the world through a pane of glass or you feel like your consciousness is hovering back here behind your head so in some ways it's very similar it, for me, disassociation feeds back into the inability to truly experience things because I feel like I'm watching myself from a distance. Um, and these two things together make it really hard to break out of depression and also just really hard to get anything done. <laughs> um, and so now I'm going to talk about like what I do, what hopefully, you know, some of you might be able to do and have it help you to try to function in this state. Uh, number one thing, first rule with depression, like all the time, no matter what number one most important thing is that your basic needs have to be met. You need to have a system in place for meeting that. And this is what I, what I mean is you must eat, you must exercise, you must get enough sleep, you must 
take care of personal hygiene. Like, you have to take care of your body physically. Because mental illness, like physical illness, you need, like, fighting it uses up your body's resources. It takes, to cope with the condition, takes stuff out of you. Just like you need to lie in bed when you're sick so your body can fight the illness. You, when you have a mental illness, your body needs to be strong and healthy so that you can fight it. And you, so you need to, ha- to make sure that it has that fuel and those resources. And this is so hard because these are some of the things that you least want to do when you have depression. Um, and so if you are prone to depression, if you have dysthymia, um, or if you have depressive episodes or whatever, you need to have a plan in place for how this gets done. My first major depressive episode happened, I think, like 20 years ago when my high school boyfriend left me. And what I went through then, this was, this is my depressive episode. This is my grief processing process. And I learned it well. Um, When you are having a major depressive episode, you need somebody there to help you. Like, um that at that time, you know, my parents would make sure I ate. They would, you know, make sure I took baths, um, et cetera, et cetera. Like, and they had to, to be there to make sure I did that. Uh, now when I have depressive episodes, you know, my boyfriend is there and he does that, which is really, really hard because as we've talked about in other things, he has ADHD. So he can't remember to take care of himself. Remembering to check up on my food and check up on my well-being and be like, you know, have you exercised? Have you eaten? Did you take a bath? And if your answers to this are no, I have to make you do it. I mean, I don't mean make in a bad way. One of your, you know, skills with this is if you have any kind of major depression and somebody has to take care of you, you need to train them how to take care of you. Frequently what I need with this, which is really hard for him uh, because of his ADHD, is I need someone to body double me, which is ironic because body doubling is actually something that is recommended for people with ADHD where somebody sits in the room with you so you don't get distracted. Like, I would love you know, a thing where it's like, I need to eat, or I need to take a bath, or I need to exercise, to just have him sit there in the room while I do it. I mean, I even, you know, maybe I'll suggest this in the future, like, we could pull out a handheld, and he could play video games on the handheld or something, just so that he's in the room, and, like, I know that I can't avoid doing it. Um, you know, for me, that having somebody body double for me like that is what's useful for me to make sure that I actually take, you know, do my basic care. Uh, and again, like I said, because of his condition, that's really hard for him. Um, but you need to know what, what you need, what would help you to actually do these things. And, you know, I, I have a hard time sleeping. Um, And so I've done various things to help me sleep. This is what I use the CBD oil for. I take a little bit of it right before bed. And this has allowed me to actually sleep through the night again, uh, which just never would happen before. Uh, That actually brings me to my next point um, for how to manage and deal with your depression which is know what your weak points are. Um, I have spent years like identifying when am I most likely to either just be overwhelmed by depression or to slip into depression. Uh, So (laughs) as in mythology, the weakest points are the in-between points. Uh, when I am, when I'm engaged in an activity, 
I am usually okay. It's when I stop doing an activity and start doing another activity that is the difficulty. And particularly, so taking baths, hard for me because I'm, you know, you get relaxed in the bath and your mind wanders. And also going to bed and waking up in the morning. Going to bed is hard for the same reason that taking a bath is hard. You are relaxed and your mind wanders and you get into this sort of like semi-conscious state where all the horrible depressive thoughts just crowd in on you and you don't have enough mental awareness to beat them back, but you're still conscious enough that they're there. Um, and I'll tell you the, uh, one of the things I've done for that, uh, waking up in the morning is important because I've read that depression is at its worst in the morning, which is frequently what I found. Even when I'm okay most of the rest of the time, I go through phases where I wake up in the morning and I'm like, I wish I hadn't woken up. I can't bear to face the world. I just want to lie here and hope I slip back into unconsciousness because I can't deal with X. I have amazingly over the past year pretty much eliminated that. Uh, and I will tell you how I did that. But, um, and the other thing, like, oversleeping apparently makes your depression worse, I've heard. And this is definitely the case for me. Like, I wake up. I'm so depressed I don't want to get out of bed, so I try to go back to sleep. But then going back to sleep, I'm actually more depressed when I wake up, so it becomes this vicious cycle. So, um, and one of the things that I found that was a problem with that is, for me, one of the things that is a big problem with my depression is decision making. Having to make choices, which is maybe weird, I don't know. but. Waking up in the morning and deciding to, like, having to, to make choices about breakfast, about what clothes to put on, would be so overwhelming I would feel like, like I just couldn't get out of bed and do it. Um, so, one of the things that I recommend uh, for depression, so reducing decisions. The more things you can sort of do on autopilot, the better. Now, you don't want to be super rigid because that can actually make the depression worse sometimes. Like, you can feel like you're on this treadmill or chained into this routine. This is a big problem with me because my boyfriend is also autistic. And autistic people are very routine focused. And the thing where he'll ask me, oh, well, why aren't you doing this at the same time that you always do it? Or why are you here when you're usually in this other... It, it, it makes me go crazy and it's really bad for my mental state because of this sense of being, like, boxed in. So try not to over-schedule yourself or make your, your routine or your lack of choices too rigid. But at the same time you know, narrowing things down, eliminating some stuff can help. So a couple things that I've done. I didn't even realize this was an issue with my depression because this happened years ago. Uh, this had to do with my desire to eat better and especially my desire to eat in a way that would cause me to build muscle because of Ariel. I'll talk about Ariel later. Um, that, and because I... <laughs> went to this, uh, I went to a cafe and had this most amazing smoothie in the world. And it was super expensive as real smoothies that you get at cafes usually are. And, um, and so, but I wanted to be able to have it all the time. And it was also super high protein. I think I've talked before about, you know, weight management and nutrition and stuff is hard for me because I'm vegetarian. And so especially like getting enough protein. And this is a, I discovered this was a really high protein thing. So I recreated this smoothie at home. And ever since then, I've had it for breakfast basically every single day for the past, you know, three years or something. Um, and I did that because I was interested in losing weight, interested in 
better health, interested in having this delicious smoothie for cheap, and most of all, interested in boosting my protein intake so I could build muscle for Ariel. And so I did it for those reasons. And then I discovered it was so amazing that I didn't have to decide what I would have for breakfast in the morning. It was such a weight off my shoulders. Um, and it was easier for me to get up in the morning then. Uh, now, of course, you know, my boyfriend handles the food prep in the house. So he makes my smoothie for me every morning. And, you know, if you have somebody that can handle food prep for you, that's, that's amazing. That's really great because it's a burden that you don't have to deal with. Like it's decisions that can overwhelm you. Um, but having, you know, something pre-planned for food, especially for that first meal in the morning when you're going to be struggling to get out of bed and maybe if you're like me, your depression will be worse. Having something pre-planned is so valuable. Having something at least partially prepared in advance would be even better, like if you have to make food yourself. Even, you know, this the smoothie is not really something I can pre-prepare because it it separates, it de-emulsifies if it sits for too long, and that's not so good. <laughs> but at least I know exactly how to fix it. If he can't make breakfast for me, I know exactly how to fix this thing. I know what to do. Um, we've also found these things. He now also makes raw um, chocolate almond cookies that also are very like nutrient dense and those can be pre-prepared if we know that there's a reason why uh neither of us are going to be able to make breakfast you know for a while he can make up a batch of those and i can pull one out of the refrigerator in the morning. uh so having things like that like having a plan for a nutritious breakfast in place and then either having someone who will make it for you or having pre-preparing it for yourself in advance, or at the very least, having it be very simple to prepare and having you to know it so you can basically do it on autopilot is very important. Um, this is less the case for other meals, but you know, I like making like big pots of spaghetti or big pans of enchiladas or something um, that you can then you can make it and then you can keep it in the refrigerator for several days. Um, if you are having a bad depressive episode, you know, doing that is a good way to make sure, um, you know, with lasagna or enchiladas, I, I prefer it cooked most of the time, but I can even eat those cold. I can just pull it out and uh, put it on a plate and eat it if I just don't feel up to doing anything. Um, and of course, you know, you got to know how to make it uh, in advance. I use, uh, in advance, you need to know how to make it so it's nutritious. I use all whole wheat pasta for my pastas. I put, make sure I put lots of vegetables in the pasta sauce or in the enchiladas or whatever. Um, so you aren't, you know, that you're still fueling your body, but knowing how to make, or if you have somebody who will do food prep for you, having them make things that are large and all you have to do is reheat them or um, even maybe not reheat them, <laughs> that can be a good way to make sure that you don't skip meals. Uh, having lots of like fresh fruit and vegetables on hand that either are pre-cut up, if they're the kind of thing that won't go bad, if they're not cut up or that you don't have to cut up, uh, right now, well, it's the end. It's the tail end of cherry season I'm and blueberry season. I'm very sad. I adore cherries and blueberries. I can eat pounds and pounds of them. If they're there, I will just keep eating them. Um, and they are so good for you. Uh, but the other thing is, all you got to do is wash them. There is no prep. You know, I can just fill a bowl with that and just start eating. Um, and that's that's a really good way, like... You know, I often don't get my fruits and vegetables like I should because they're fussy to prepare. And again, you know, I try to get my boyfriend to prepare them for me, but he sometimes doesn't either. Um, so having that, things like um, when they're in season, peaches and, and nectarines and other stone fruit, again, all you have to do is wash it. 
Unfortunately, all of these things go out of season very quickly. Like I said, this is the season for them is ending. Um, I found that green peppers, you do have to sort of cut them up, but you can just sort of cut the top off and then you have a piece there that you can chew on. And just having these like don't need much prep or like partially pre-prepared healthy snacks that you can just grab out um, or that you can have on the side with your meal are also a really good way to make sure that you're getting that nutrients without a lot of um, overloading your brain and forcing yourself to make a lot of effort when you are feeling depressed. The other thing, after I started having the smoothies for breakfast, that helped a ton, but I still would have trouble getting out of bed because I would be overwhelmed. Like I would be in tears about what I was going to wear. And then suddenly, like, you know, six months ago, I just got this idea. I'm like, let me pick out my clothes the night before because I'm more aware and I actually have it on my to-do list now. Um, pick out clothes. Sometimes I even do that in the middle of the day, like when I have a free moment. Um, I should probably go do that after this. I, you know, and I, I put it in my drawer with my night clothes and it's there. And then in the morning, I just open the drawer and go. So, I mean, and this is very important to me because I work from home. I work like irregularly. I have multiple jobs that sometimes are on and sometimes are not. I don't have to dress for work. I don't have to get up in the morning and, and go. So having that piece there, super helpful. And just things like that. If you find that there's a decision that is always tripping you up, uh, that is always like overwhelming you with your depression like it's making the depression worse or it's making it hard for you to motivate yourself because this decision is a barrier finding a way to eliminate or simplify the decision or having someone else share the burden of that decision is the best thing you can do for yourself um, reducing mind wander or roaming thoughts or overly active thoughts so that's another thing like I have this voice in my head that runs all of the time that says hurtful and horrible and you know hopeless things to me um constantly and a lot of my life is about trying to drown out this voice um, I'm always, you know, one of the things when my depression gets bad, I'll say, please don't let me be alone with my thoughts. Uh, so, you know, I tend to, uh, I, <laughs> okay, so when I was growing up, my mom would always read me a bedtime story. Actually, she she read me a bedtime story every night basically up until she got her terminal illness which was when I was in my late 20s I mean I wasn't home a lot of the time but even when I was in my late 20s and I would come home like on Christmas she would read me a bedtime story um, now the the bedtime stories got progressively more um we started reading like various world mythologies and we read, you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey and Mort d'Arthur and we we were reading uh, Alice in Weir's War of the Roses dense history book. That was the thing that, that we were reading when she got diagnosed and I, I still have emotions about that. But um, this was a useful tool for me to learn from. Um, my ex-husband, sometimes he would play video games in bed while we were trying to fall asleep and I could, you know, listen to the video game. And that was kind of like having a bedtime story. Uh, sometimes, like, my boyfriend and I now would watch videos f before bed for a long time. But then I found the thing where it's like having the, the screen on um, can make it hard for you to fall asleep and also like the sound is irregular um so sometimes like this the volume will go up and it will wake you up and that was the thing I also like would watch documentaries even at night like I would just play documentaries all night I wonder if this is a genetic condition because my mom used to sleep in front of the tv 
Like she would literally just be in front of the TV and just sort of doze on and off there all night and would not go up to bed until 6 a.m. Fortunately, because we now have computers and the internet, um, I've never had to do that. I would just put on stuff on my computer and sleep with it. Uh, but that also had similar problems that the with the irregular volume and stuff. I used to watch uh, Ken Burns' Civil War documentary. Apparently, people claim this is like legendary for being good at putting you to sleep and stuff. Um, now, my boyfriend actually will read me, you know, bedtime stories. We we have like a reading list on Project Gutenberg that we're working our way through. We we're currently reading, you know, Dracula and we have, we just like my mom and I used to do, we make funny jokes about what we're reading and stuff like that. Which if you have somebody that's willing to do that for you, that's great and that can help a lot. But you, you might not or they might always be up for it. And then there's also that thing where there's a certain point where they need to go to bed and you may still need the mental distraction. So, um, I have, uh, you can do audiobooks, like if you are into that, you can get an Audible subscription from Amazon and get audiobooks that you can have your device read to you. I really like, um, sort of documentaries and non-fiction and stuff, so I, uh, the two places I get mine are the In Our Time podcast, where they have all of their their uh, podcasts. It's from BBC, and they have them all up for free online. And the other one is The Great Courses, or rather The Great Courses Plus. It used to be Great Courses Plus. It has now been renamed Wonderum and is decreasing in quality. But, you know, if you get a special deal, you can get it for... 10 to 15 dollars a month and it's so great <laughs> and I don't like being on my computer a lot that also being on my computer can make me depressed or I can as my boyfriend describes it go down a rabbit hole start like searching on the internet and just waste the entire day and possibly see something on there that makes me depressed uh so I I download this stuff onto my phone basically I will have loaded up like you know several hours of lectures or podcasts or whatever from these sites uh, and play through them like when I try to go to sleep. Um, I usually only have like, I have a playlist that has maybe an hour on it so that it won't like keep other people up all night that I'll have fallen asleep by that. If I wake up, of course, I can restart it. And as I work through it, I delete those and you know, listen to new ones. And I also listen to them in the bath. I got a deal for a Great Courses subscription last year, and I used to dread taking baths, and now it's like I just put on a lecture when I get in the bath, and I don't have depressive episodes in the bath anymore. And again, you know, I particularly like, you know, things about history and stuff like that. So these are great for me, but like I said, you know, there's Audible or a hundred other audiobook subscriptions that you can get out there if you prefer, um, fic if you prefer fiction or something like that. Just having that there, even if you don't use it all the time, just having that there is a, I have this thing on my phone and I can listen to it and, you know, get away from myself if I need to. Uh, that's a very powerful tool that I have that I can use sometimes. Um, having a loose routine, I strongly recommend. You don't want to have no routine because then it's too easy to just buckle under the weight of the depression and spend a whole day just staring at the ceiling. But you don't want to have too tight a routine because then you can, you know, be driven to exhaustion by it and you do sometimes need to slow down and take breaks when you're dealing with depression. Um, so having a general structure of how your day is going to go and stuff. So for example, I have, I started out with this, I wanted to do 45 minutes of exercise a day and 30 minutes of stretching. 
as well as 30 minutes of sort of like housework type stuff like cleaning things up or like building things or you know various things related to the house um and that was too rigid that was too oppressive because if something would come up then i wouldn't get my day's quota and i would fall apart um so then i got i switched it to i need to do an average of that a day and so i have now i added you know, I multiplied that all out by seven and I have weekly totals that I keep track of, which reminds me that I need to do at least a little bit every day. But if I have a disaster and I don't make that in a day, or like sometimes, you know, some of my yoga sets are like 60 minutes or like if I have an aerial lesson, it's 60 minutes. And so I can go, you know, lay in insurance in the bank when I do that because it's more than my 45 minute average and then if I have a bad day later it's okay <laughs> um and so for me that system is better like but I also have things like you know Farnius and I try to do editing on my writing each day and we do it you know, fairly early in the morning usually, which motivates me to get my morning tasks done. Um, so that, like, because I have that accountability to him, I'm more effective at getting things done. Uh, but we also have a system where we can renegotiate the time or, like, one of us can say if we're not feeling up to it that day or something like that. So that it's not, like, ultra, ultra rigid. Um, another thing I highly recommend for depression, this is actually what motivated me to make this video. Um, if you don't have one, I really, really recommend getting a, a pet. Somebody, it was a video I saw somebody talking about how having his cat, like, really helped his depression. And that is definitely true for me. Like, <laughs> you know, during quarantine and I, you know, I'm been that's made my depression so so much worse like there was so much when I was just like there is nothing to live for everything in my life has fallen apart like there's no point to anything and I would wake up in the morning and I would have kitties on me and I would be like oh my god like there is something in this world that loves me and cares about me and needs me and I have to get out of bed because of that. And it, you know, it was indispensable. Absolutely indispensable. Um, I recommend, like, I am a massive cat lover. So I think the best animal that you could get would be a cat. Uh, for several reasons. I mean, because pur like cat purring is designed to be healing and relaxing and to elevate mood like that's its purpose that's what it's supposed to do so i mean you know when i hold a cat and it purrs it's it is absolute bliss <laughs> um and also they're they're uh they're not low maintenance like people say that cats are low maintenance they're they're not uh but in some ways they're a little bit usually unless you have a very fussy cat they're a little bit more flexible than like a dog if you don't take the dog out for a walk at the right time or you don't like have it go to the bathroom when it needs to or you know it could pee indoors or start like tearing your house apart or something um so in some ways cats also kind of fit into that uh like there is structure and responsibility here but there's a certain amount of flex um but you know some people are allergic uh or whatever there's also you know some dogs are great for this as well um maybe some rodents or even like a snake or something um the only thing what i would say is what you really need um is you need 
an animal that's going to love being cuddled because that's what you really need you need the feeling of being able to hold another living thing and being able to see and feel it breathe and be able to you know feel the contact and feel the emotional bond between you and it um and uh so if you're gonna if you're going to go with something like a dog or a cat either you know know the animal well like talk to the person you're adopting it from and find out if it is if it is a lap sitter and it likes to be cuddled or you know get one very young so you can train it up that way uh, when it comes to like snakes and rodents, know your uh, know your breed. <laughs> Basically, uh, some like it and some don't. Like, if for example, I would recommend getting something like a bull python if you were going to get a snake because they like to sit quietly, <laughs> uh, and also they're constrictors and you know. Sitting with a constrictor, like constrictors tend to be slower. They they will sit quietly on you frequently, um, and also they can. <laughs> I've heard you know people with constrictors talk about how it feels like being hugged, uh, and but some species of snakes are a lot more active and are not going to want to sit there with you. And also true with some species of rodents. Probably I wouldn't recommend a bird because birds like to perch more than maybe like a larger bird. Like a lot of people have house chickens now maybe you could get a house chicken to like sit with you um i i don't know because i don't know that much about chickens um but just you know again having you know another living creature that you can have contact with is it's emotionally soothing and when you feel that love connection with it it really you know helps um and you know so i i would highly recommend that if you don't have a don't have a an animal kettle buddy already um and obviously like know know your limits in terms of depression because I think having an animal is good because it also, you know, even when I'm depressed, like, I know that I have to get up out of bed to, like, you know, clean my cat's litter box or give them medicine or, you know, whatever, like, I have a responsibility to care for them. But also know, like, if your depression is going to make this hard, again, maybe you want to go with something like a snake that doesn't have to eat every day. Um in case you have like some bad days versus like a dog that's going to pee on things if you don't take it out um so n know your own limits too and make sure that you can give the animal you know proper care um, so these are sort of i guess that's kind of the bridge into the sort of advanced techniques <laughs> uh i have to final things that I want to talk about that I consider sort of like higher level that are about pulling things together. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about is harnessing the power of productive addictions and rewards. Um, I am obsessed with Ariel. If you don't know, Ariel is like circus it's like what the people in Cirque du Soleil do uh when you're on the trapeze or you're on the rope or something and you do like flips and you hang from things and you contort yourself into weird poses and stuff I do this <laughs> I do it a lot <laughs> well not so much anymore like I'm working my way back up but uh before I got injured and then there was quarantine I was doing it four days a week uh, and I am obsessed with it and one of the reasons I'm obsessed with it is because it is one of the few things that can pierce my anhedonia and my disassociation um, 
because it is so intense that it overrides that it pulls me back into my body and I, I saw this thing in this video that kind of annoyed me that was talking about don't try to treat your anhedonia by being a risk taker on stuff um, and okay so she was talking about bungee jumping which is like insanely risky and you know doesn't necessarily have any benefit other than being scary but um you know i because i know that i do that now i would not consider myself an adrenaline junkie because i'm not going to do something just because it gives me an adrenaline hit. like ariel is very special in that regard um i mean i do you know i understand like people who bungee jump or skydive or something they probably have somewhat of the same situation and that there's that moment where you think you are going to die and that makes you believe like that that makes you realize that you really do want to live um that you know i you know i climb up 30 feet and in aerial there's no net there's a mat at the bottom but you know i'm up there 30 feet there is it is my hands and nothing else and of course i think yeah i could let go and then I'm, i don't want to let go i don't want to let go um and that you know the fact that it, it activates my survival instinct it proves that my will to live is stronger than my depression um but here's the thing and this is what i mean about productive addictions and rewards like people are always saying like you have to you know reward yourself you have to give yourself that dopamine hit the problem is with a lot of those things those things that do that are bad for you i am you know i have been borderline alcoholic in the past like i became Fornius is from Australia and they drank like guppies and I was not prepared for that and it was so seductive because it was able to make everything go away and that was so nice for me and it was such an easy route to take or like you know I, I study a lot of stuff about um how to function with autism and ADHD to help him. And a lot of the stuff I just look at that and I'm like, because they're like, oh, you need to motivate yourself. You need to give yourself a little reward. Like, you know, they're like, watch a video on YouTube, have a soda, have a piece of candy, like whatever, you know, do this thing to give yourself this little reward to keep yourself motivated. And I'm like, but he already has you know, weight and eating problems and he already has like problems with <laughs> addiction with with watching the computer all the time. And so I'm like, you know, using that as a reward doesn't <laughs> doesn't seem helpful in that situation. Um and so like the idea is I don't know, finding things that are rewards that are not bad <laughs> i guess is the thing so you know this is this is my thing that it's like yes i'm doing ariel for the adrenaline hit i'm doing it you know because it it breaks through my disassociation and anhedonia but let's put it this way first of all it is phenomenal exercise it is it is I, a really extreme workout um but on top of that you know because of that you have to take really good care of yourself um my aerial is a constant motivation to me to stay in shape to eat well to get enough sleep to keep my drinking under control because if you don't do these things your ability to do aerial <laughs> is affected and you know best case scenario like 
it just means that you like operate at a, a lower skill level. Worst case scenario, it means you have an accident. <laughs> so that is a huge motivation for me to take care of myself. Um, also, Ariel is expensive, and therefore it is also a motivation for me to try to remain gainfully employed, uh, which is really hard when you're depressed. So the thing is that you want to find something like that you're addicted to or that's rewarding for you or something that has a positive ripple effect. Like, you know, I've talked about the fact that I eat all these cherries and blueberries. Like, you know, that sometimes is my, my go-to reward versus like, you know, having candy or something. And I actually, it's, I don't like candy. I don't really like commercial baked goods. You know, I'm lucky that way. Uh, it's not a, it's not a matter of saying like, oh, here's this healthy reward. I really want to have candy, but I'm going to eat fruit instead. Like it's finding, you know, the thing, the thing that you really want that has positive effects. Um, I, one of the things I've worked very hard with, with Fornius is finding ways to make, you know, even like desserts that I like or something, finding ways to make them that's really healthy and still delicious for me. Um, or like, you know, I, I don't know what, what would work for other people, but you want to find something that, that, that you f feel a compulsion for that is really like, um, a powerful drive for you that has positive, like, ripple effects. That it's not just that you're getting in the adrenaline hit or the dopamine hit or whatever from doing that thing, but it also has ancillary positive effects. Um, and the final thing, the thing that I would finally say, um, and I don't know if this is possible for everybody, but a thing that I've done that really helps me to deal with my depression is the concept of having a higher calling. Um, which, you know, the most obvious example of this is religious faith, which is the case for me, but it's a little bit more complex than that. Um, that, I mean, anyone that has like, you know, a, a faith-based um, belief system that is meaningful to them, you know, this is a thing that you can use, you can draw on to give yourself strength and a way to contextualize what you are experiencing. Um, I, I think that it's, you know, if you are not strongly religious, I think it is possible to tie this to other value systems. Um, I'm not entirely sure how that would work, but for, you know, for me, in some ways, folding this into my religion was related to a value system that I already have. So I um, have always been very, very duty-based, duty-driven to an absurd degree. Um, I uh, had a very bad depression the year after I graduated from college and I I don't know that I've ever really had true suicidal ideation in my life. But I mean, it was this sort of like vague thing in the back of my head that I was kind of like, oh, well, I could do it. Um, and then I was taking this sort of recreational Latin class at the time, the long story. Uh, but I remember I would think, no, you can't kill yourself because if you did, you wouldn't be able to turn in your Latin homework tomorrow and you'd get a bad grade. Which I know sounds ridiculous on like from a logical standpoint. But the point is that my sense of duty and my desire to, you know, do well 
was so strong that that <laughs> reasoning carried weight with me. Um, and, you know, that, that devotion to duty has um, carried through uh, all of my life. You know, the, the main thing, the biggest thing now is that I am, you know, the provider and caregiver for my boyfriend. And that is, you know, a duty that I have. And, I mean, forget, like, you know, suicidal ideation, even on a way more, like, minor level than that. The... I need to get up off the floor to do X because it's necessary for our lives and our household to work. And I have dependence. I have a responsibility. Um, you know, that is a huge motivation. And then the way that I've folded that into, you know, my religion, I, I, have, you know, subscribed to a faith where performing one's duty and keeping one's commitments is viewed as a sacred act. Uh, and so I am, you know, by resisting my depression and, you know, performing these things, I am answering a sacred calling, which is Um, and I've also folded, you know, Ariel into that because, <laughs> you know, Ariel is kind of like this, this treadmill, um, that it's this thing that you have to just keep putting things back into and to view that as part of my, you know, sacred commitment to duty as well, which also helps me keep focused and motivated on doing this thing that's helpful in so many ways and ultimately like you know there there are people who are a lot more religiously active than me there are people that have a much higher level of devotion than me uh but you know i have tried to you know have some sort of you know experience of prayer on a daily basis and with depression it's hard and you know I sometimes all I can do you know will I I mean there have been times in the past year with everything with the pandemic that, that, that there are times when I've you know gone to my home altar and I've screamed I've wept you know I've just poured out all of that emotion there that I had nowhere to put uh, but there are also times when it's like, I don't feel like I can do this. I feel utter despair. Um, and I certainly, there's lots of times, you know, especially after everything that's happened in the past year where I find it hard to believe that anything would care about me or whatever. Um, and, you know, and so my prayers are not, you know, I frequently don't feel like I can either ask for anything or feel grateful for anything. But the one thing I can give is my presence. That there are times when I've, you know, because I, I have it as a, a daily thing I'm supposed to do, I, you know, stagger to my altar and like hold myself up on the end of it and just say, I am here. I have come. I am present here. Like, I don't care if I hate you. I don't care if you won't help me. That doesn't matter. What matters is I am here. And if that is all I can do, that if that's all that there is, that's... <sighs> so... Anyway, this is what my life with depression looks like. 
these are some of the techniques that I've used to mitigate it, cope with it, keep my life functioning even though I have it. And hopefully some of them will be helpful to somebody. Um, so yeah, just just this has just been what my experience is and I hope that somebody finds it beneficial or you know makes them feel better to know that somebody else is going through something similar or whatever. Um, so yeah, thanks. Bye.